Welcome along to Taking the Beers, the channel dedicated to A-level business studies revision, of course. In this video, we're going to take a look at a theory known as Bowman's Strategic Clock. So what do we know? Michael Porter developed a strategy known as his two generic strategies, which set out what we refer to as the strategic positioning options for organizations. And Porter said there really are only two different positions firms can take up in the marketplace in order to be successful. They've either got to be the lowest cost producer in that marketplace. So they drive down costs and pass that on to consumers in the form of lower prices, and they can be successful. If you're not going to adopt that strategy, you need to differentiate your business in some way. Offer consumers some kind of value that they're prepared to pay more then they would pay the low cost producer in that marketplace. So those are the two strategic positions you can take up, being a low cost producer or differentiating yourself in some way. But I did extend on that a little bit further and said you could adopt both of those strategies in a niche market rather than a mass market if you wanted to, but there are your two points. And he said what firms have got to be wary of is becoming what he known as stuck in the middle, falling between those two strategies, which he saw as the route to being unsuccessful. But a chap called Bowman saw those two generic strategies as a little bit limited, as a little bit restrictive for firms in their strategic positioning. And so what he developed was a strategic clock made up of eight different strategies that he saw firms utilizing. And crucially, he brings to the table some strategic positions which he believed could be successful and profitable, which Porter had advised firms not to take up. So let's talk you through the eight different positions on Bowman's strategic clock. So we'll start with number one down in the bottom left hand corner here. And Bowman said that some firms take up what he referred to as a low price, low value position. So these are firms that are charging rock bottom prices for what they sell, but they are selling what we know, uh, what we refer to as inferior goods. Goods that are okay to sell when we are in a recession and people are on very tight budgets and are looking for um, the cheapest prices they can possibly find. But consumers might turn away from these products as their incomes start to grow. So what Bowman said is that this is a plausible strategy, but it is a challenge, especially it's a challenge in certain points in the economic cycle. So when we move into recoveries and booms and people's income start to grow, using this low price, low value strategy can be a challenge. Even when we are in a recession or a slump, when people might start to look for low price, even if they know that the value that they're receiving is also quite low, it can still be a challenge and it relies on us absolutely maxing out being or taking advantage of economies of scale. Unless we can drive down unit costs, this is a very difficult strategy to make work because the profit margins per sale they're gonna be quite slender because of that low price that we're charging. So it can work, and if you have a look at examples like pound stores, for example, they charge very low prices, and consumers know that what they're selling there is quite low value, but it is a strategy that can work, particularly advantageous at certain points in the economic cycle, but the key is economies of scale. We've gotta get those rumbling along there because the lower we can drive down unit costs, the more we might just be able to manipulate what are very, very slender profit margins. Point two on Bowman Strategic Clock is just a regular low price strategy. And we can draw links between this and Porter's low cost producer strategy. So this time we are charging incredibly low prices. We're aiming to be the lowest price firm in the marketplace, but crucially we're not selling inferior goods this time. We could be selling regular goods that consumers may continue to buy even as we move through different stages of the economic cycle. But this time we are trying to pass on to them the cost savings that we might be able to make in an organization and so we're trying to be competitive we're trying to take up the position of being the lowest priced firm 
in that industry. Now, again, it is absolutely vital if we're to be cost leaders and if we're to pass on cost savings to uh, consumers, it's crucial that we've got the economies of scale in play once again. So with this kind of strategy, you might be looking at producing on a very large scale. You're putting out a very high volume of sales, but you need that high volume of sales because again, your profit margins per sale are going to be quite slender. And unless you can drive down those unit costs, unless you can rigorously find way of reducing your unit costs of production, again, this can be a challenging strategy to make work. But if you can get those economies of sale rumbling, then this could be an effective strategy because consumers are gonna look at you as the lowest cost firm in this marketplace, and it gives them a reason to pick your business. Point three on Bowman's strategic clock is what we call the hybrid position, where we've got a mid-range price, but we've started to offer consumers some kind of differentiation. So we're, we're starting to offer them slightly more value with the product that we sell. Now, crucially, this is what Porter referred to as being stuck in the middle, but Bowman sets this out as potentially a successful strategy. So we're in the mid-range price category, and we've started to offer consumers more value than we were before. So Bowman said that this is a strategic position that can work because some consumers want to feel like they are striving beyond just purchasing from the lowest cost firm in that market. They're not looking to pay the highest prices, but they are looking for slightly more value than they might get from firms selling in position one or two. So Bowman pointed out that this is actually a strategy that could attract customers, those that are slightly more aspirational and looking for slightly more value than the first two positions might provide us with, but are not looking to pay the highest prices for that privilege. And so Bowman said you may be able to amass yourself a market share for these slightly more aspirational customers, whereas Porter said this is a strategy to avoid. It would be what he referred to as being stuck in the middle. Point four on Bowman's strategic clock again links to Porter. So this is his differentiation strategy, which again Bowman said is a perfectly plausible strategic position. So here we're trying to get away from being the lowest cost producer. We're charging mid prices, maybe even going to the higher end price of the marketplace. But crucially, we have found some way of offering customers increased value. We have found that point of differentiation. We have found either that USP, that unique selling proposition that draws customers to us, or we've done it through the strength of our brand name and so consumers are willing to pay higher prices to purchase from the firm that's got the stronger brand name in the industry and again like Porter Bowman says this is a perfectly plausible strategy there's going to be consumers out there that are going to be willing to pay more if you can find that selling proposition that they value more highly. So it could be brand name, but it could be things like customer service. It could be things like delivery times. It could be things like the promotional opportunities that you put into the marketplace. So these are things that might just draw customers in who are prepared to pay a higher price for the privilege. Point five on Bowman Strategic Clock, again linked to Porter. We're using a differentiation strategy, but this time in niche markets. And Bowman said this really is the opportunity for organizations to be charging much higher prices. When you're targeting a niche, when you are meeting consumers' needs more specifically, and when you're in a marketplace where there may be less competitors that are able to meet the needs of that niche more specifically, you can max out the prices that you're charging. You might have a lower volume of sales because you're in a niche marketplace but you can absolutely create that greater added value. You can get away with charging more for your products because you're really hitting the needs of consumers that much more specifically. So if we go around our clock here, Bowman has got five different positions that he said were incredibly plausible as strategic positions to take up in the marketplace, ranging from just offering very, very low value in return for very low prices, all the way around to differentiating what you sell for a niche market and charging a pretty penny for the privilege. 
But Bowman also brought to the table three further strategies that he'd seen firms adopting. But each of these strategies, at least in the long run, are probably going to be unsuccessful if firms continue to take them up. So if we start with point six, Bowman noticed that there were some firms that were charging higher prices for products that were only offering a, a kind of a, a modest amount of value. They may have some form of differentiation to them, but really not sufficient to warrant the high prices that were being charged. And what Bowman said was that this was probably a result of businesses making marketing mistakes. So maybe they've launched new products onto the market. They thought those products would be perceived as having greater value than they actually have. And so they've launched it with a higher price, but that strategy has actually been an error. And why it may experience some success in the shorter term, whilst consumers realise that the value being offered by this product is not as great as perhaps marketed, in the longer run, this is going to be a difficult strategy to make work. So in the longer run, it can actually lead to quite high profit margins per sale because we're selling at a high price and maybe if those benefits offered are only of mid value this product has not been the most expensive to produce and manufacture so the margins might be quite good but as soon as the market as a whole begins to twig that this is a product not really offering the benefits that may have been promised or may have been marketed it's gonna lose sales and it's gonna lose market share and so the firm may need to think about changing this strategy to one of the others on the strategic clock the next position that is very very difficult to sustain is where you charge a high price for your products and the value that it offers is incredibly low now already that sounds like a strategy or strategic position that's just not going to work consumers are not going to pay a premium price for a good or a service that is only offering them the most modest forms of value According to Bowman, the only real situation where this strategy could be effective is if a firm finds itself in a monopoly and it really wants to exploit or take advantage of consumers. So in certain monopolies where a firm finds itself as the only producer of that good or service, they may be able to get away with charging a higher price for a good or service that really doesn't offer a great deal of value, but because consumers are not blessed with the luxury of choice, they have to continue to purchase from that firm because they are in a monopoly position and they're exploiting their monopoly power for their own profit incentives. But still, unless you're in that monopoly position, point seven on Bowman Strategic Clock, really, really difficult strategy to see that it could work. Point eight on the strategy is where we offer low value, but we're trying to get away with charging a mid price for our product so we're not going at lowest cost producers here we're offering customers very little by way of value but we're trying to position our prices more in the middle range of the market Bowman said that this strategy is not going to work and for one good reason somebody's going to come along and undercut us if what we sell is low value there will be other firms out there selling at low value but if we're more expensive than them why are consumers ever going to choose us? They're gonna go for firms that are adopting point one, adopting point two on the strategic clock. If we're charging more than rivals, but offering no more value than they charge, then again, in the longer term, this is just not gonna be a strategic position that firms are going to be able to use. Eventually, people are gonna realize that we are charging more than rivals are for a product that's offering no greater value. So there we go, there's Bowman's strategic clock. We've got five positions around his clock that Bowman prophesized are perfectly plausible and workable strategic positions to take up. We've got three further positions there that are very, very difficult in order to make work. Point six, very difficult to make work for longer than a short period of time. Seven, difficult to make work unless you're in a monopoly situation. And eight, just downright difficult to make work. So there we go, slightly different to Porter's strategy. Porter said if you become stuck in the middle, then that's probably going to lead to your business not maximizing success. Bowman's actually set out more of a spectrum 
are strategic positions that firms can take up and it gives organizations and it gives managers a greater degree of choice in the strategic positions that they might choose for their organization. Hope that one helps you out. As always, keep on taking the biz. Good luck with your revision. See you next time.